Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Grabowski, and I'll be your host for today. Really excited. Uh, every day at 2 p.m. Eastern or 11 a.m. Pacific, we get to do another SciComm story time. So these events are a ton of fun. We get to talk to different science communicators, uh, communicators from a variety of fields from all across North America, and they get to share exciting stories. Uh, and then we get to have a little bit of live Q&A action with them. So it's been a blast. Uh, so far, and we're going to continue things rolling today with Marin Hunsberger. So Marin is a microbiologist and science explainer who loves making videos about science. So she creates videos for Seeker, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, and her own personal YouTube channel. And she talks all kinds of science, but especially the tiny, creepy, crawly, germy things. So Marin, it's so great to have you joining us live today from the West Coast. We're excited to get to know you a little bit better. And of course, we'll fire away with a little Q&A action. Exciting. I'm so excited to be here. So the stuff I have to talk about today, as Joe mentioned, is that I am a microbiologist, which means that I study bacteria, viruses, fungi, and all kinds of little tiny, um, you can call them parasites, but that is a little, you know, like a negative uh, vibe. Sometimes parasites can be good things too. And we're going to talk a little bit about that because as I'm sure everyone watching is aware, we are currently experiencing a very different world from our norm because of a virus, right? I have a picture of it here. We're calling it the novel coronavirus. You might hear it called COVID-19, corona, coronavirus, or um, SARS-CoV-2. And of course, there are tons and tons and tons of microbes that do make us sick. Those are usually viruses, uh, bacteria, and some parasites, and they can cause things that we typically think of when we hear those words. Infection, um, some kinds of diseases, uh, lots of infectious diseases, which means things that make us sick that can be passed from human to human, right? And so that can be pretty scary. And sometimes it can make us all think like, oh, microbes equal bad. All bacteria are bad all viruses are bad and they all make us sick. And while a lot of them do, there are uh, infinitely equal or sometimes even more viruses and bacteria that make up our world and that really make it go around. They, they make our bodies and our world function, basically. So I'm going to tell you today a little bit about my favorite things that microbes do for us in the world that are good. And then I'll tell you a little bit about myself and how I got into what I do. So let's get started. So I want to talk about your body first. So when we're born, when we come out of our moms, inside of our mom's bellies, it's totally sterile. There's no bacteria, no viruses in there, if we're healthy, that get into our mom's um, womb when we're inside her. And then when we come out, we get this big dose of bacteria from our mom. So we get sort of uh, in uh, like bathed in the outside world so that we start to have some uh, protection against anything else out there. Because in our bodies, we have tons and tons and tons of good bacteria, trillions of good bacteria inside us and on us that keep the bad stuff from making us sick. So if we have enough of the good bacteria inside of our stomachs and our guts and our mouths, then it keeps anything that wants to make us sick from like getting a foothold and establishing a community and making us sick. So we have tons and tons and tons of good microbes inside us to thank for keeping us from getting sick. That starts in your mouth and in your nose. So we have this incredibly diverse community of bacteria inside of our mouths. They're living all inside your gums and in between your teeth and in your saliva. And they uh, are, are plentiful enough that they're keeping any bad guys from making you sick. And then as we go down further inside your body, there are all kinds of good microbes in there that are also helping you digest your food. And without them, we couldn't get the nutrients from the food that we need. So we, if we, if we sort of magically got rid of all of the microbes inside of our bodies, we would be really, really, really sick and we wouldn't be able to digest our food properly. We wouldn't be able to get the nutrients that we need from it. And we wouldn't really be able to 
to live without a lot of medical help. So we have the bacteria inside of our bodies to thank for that. Now, on the subject of food, you have bacteria to thank for so many of your favorite foods. I've got one right here that's one of my favorites. It's called kimchi. And it's like a cabbagey, uh, spicy, um, savory topping for food. And it's fermented. So that means that it's been treated with some microbes, usually bacteria, that have digested some of that cabbage and then produced a fermentation reaction, which makes it have a nice probiotic uh, a component, which means that it's got good bacteria in it, in the food itself. And then also the cabbage feeds good bacteria inside of you. If you like yogurt, or if you like something called kefir, which is a fermented milk product, if you like bread, if you like, uh, if you're an adult and you like beer and wine, we have uh, bacteria and yeast, which is a fungi, a fungus, um, to thank for making those for us. So uh, I think that's something we don't often think about when we, when we think about our food is that you know usually when you look in your fridge and you're like oh no this went bad this is moldy we have to throw this out i can't eat it it'll make me sick there are also all kinds of good fungi and good bacteria that are making the foods that you love really tasty and uh edible so i think that's always really fun to think about um especially in terms of bread i think most people don't think that bread itself is the result of a yeast reaction um, I have another, uh, in terms of food, another thing to show you, which is this plant from my house. It's a little succulent pot. And this is just to demonstrate that we couldn't even have most plants and a lot of the foods that we eat come from plants like corn, like wheat, other things like that, they all have roots, right? That go down into the soil and those roots help the plant take up water and nutrients from the soil, but they can't do it all by themselves. Lots of them have little communities like tiny little towns of both fungi and bacteria on those roots that help them take up all of the nutrients that they need to grow. So those fungi and those bacteria also have a really cool relationship where they talk to each other and one of them has one nutrient and one of them has another nutrient and they trade back and forth because they can only do their specific job. And then they're also communicating with the plant to make sure that the plant gets all of those nutrients up in its leaves that are uh, processing the sunshine. So without bacteria and fungi, we also couldn't have most of the plants that we rely on, both for our home decor and also for our, um, our all of the things that we eat. Now, on the subject of viruses, I'm going to show you one of my favorite posters. This is all of the algae that we have here on the Pacific coast where I live. I'm in California. And these are all of the different kinds of algae. And you may have seen things like seals and otters and whales even in videos about the Pacific uh, Ocean. And all of them depend on greenery or um, uh, primary producers like algae. And algae communities um, whether that be kelp or whether that be tiny, tiny, tiny little microscopic green things could not survive without this very unique community of both bacteria and viruses in our oceans. Again, it's really difficult to think about viruses in any other way than a cold or a flu, but there are tons of viruses that we don't think would ever make us sick that live in our oceans and that live in conjunction with this community of bacteria. And they balance each other out and are talking to each other all the time to make this balance of nutrients in the ocean so that things like algae can flourish and then everything that then radiates on up from the algae. So all of the little fish that eat the algae and then everything that eats the fish, like sea otters, like seals, like whales, like dolphins, can all thrive together. So I always like to think that all of those big, exciting, majestic animals that you can see uh, that live in the ocean are all there because of these tiny, 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 tiny little things that you can't see, bacteria and viruses. Um, one last thing that I want to share with you about uh, viruses, just to leave us with a little positivity about a virus in particular, because the virus is what's making all of our lives a little different right now, is that 
there are certain kinds of bacteria or certain kinds of viruses called bacteriophages. And bacteriophages eat bacteria. So if you picture a bacterium like a little antelope, a bacteriophage is like a lion on the Serengeti that would chase it and then eat that antelope bacterium. Uh, and something that's very exciting about bacteriophages is that we're starting to try and use them to fight really, really bad bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. So if the bacterium has become resistant to the drugs that we usually use to treat it, say you have an infection and the infection is not responding to antibiotics and the doctor is like, oh no, what are we gonna do? How are we gonna make this person better? They may try something called phage therapy where they have a virus that's going to uh, eat that bacterium that we've altered so that it doesn't interact with any human cells and it attacks uh, the bacterium. Um, it is highly personalized and highly specialized, so it can take a long time to implement, which is why we don't use it very commonly and we only use it in really drastic situations. But I think um, phages, bacteriophages in particular, are really exciting to talk about because they're an example of a virus that does something really, really good for us directly as humans. So that's my spiel about microbes and how awesome they are and how good they are for the world and how we could never have a world without them. Um, they make our bodies and our worlds go around. Um, and now I can talk a little bit about myself and my background and how I got into what I do, if that's helpful. Just a couple quick minutes on that. Um, I, in college, I accidentally became a science major. I never thought I was going to be a scientist <laughs> in high school. Um, I always felt like I was kind of bad at science and math, I didn't really feel like it was my strength. Um, I always really loved English, I loved writing, um, I loved theater, you might be able to tell I'm a theater kid, <laughs> I really love uh, presenting and performing. Um, and so when I came to college, I thought I was gonna be an English major. I started taking all of the English classes and I was like, oh, I was having an okay time, but it just wasn't that interesting. And I went to school on the East Coast. I went to school in Virginia. I went to the College of William and Mary and it's beautiful there. And I love, love, love the outdoors. As you can see, I'm wearing my protect and preserve our national parks t-shirt. I'm a big outdoor kind of gal. Um, and so I said, okay, what can I major in instead that will let me be outside more often <laughs> than inside reading books. Um, and that answer was environmental science, um, which is where I learned all about microbial interactions for plant nutrients and plant growth. Uh, and then I, I had to pair environmental science with another science. You couldn't just major in environmental science. So I was like, ah, all right, I guess I'll major in biology, um, which is why I said, I say I sort of accidentally became a scientist. I never intended on being a biology major. And then I started taking those classes and I could not stop talking about it to everybody. I'd like call my mom and be like, I listen to what I learned in molecular genetics today. It was so exciting. And I still had this feeling of like, I'm not very good at this. Like I'm not as good at this as some of my peers who have been planning on being a bio major or planning on being a doctor since they were a tiny kid. Um, and I sort of still had that feeling that I didn't really belong there. And it wasn't until I found microbiology, which I had no idea really even existed until I accidentally became a biology major, that I was like, oh no, wait, this is what I want to do. This is, this is what I have to do. And it was that, that experience of finding something that just was, I was so passionate about made me realize that it's, nobody's really good at anything. You just have to love it. Um, and if you love it enough, and if you have that passion and that, and that excitement, you will be able to make it work for you no matter what. Um, even if, you know, calculus was still very scary for me, even if I still don't feel that confident as a mathematician, right? It doesn't matter because I love my subject so much that I know that that's what I want to do. Um, alongside all of that science stuff, I was also just making science videos because as I mentioned, I loved performing, I loved talking about science, I wanted to make science more exciting for all of my friends who were like, 
I'm a history major. I'm not interested in that at all. No, thank you. Um, which is how I got into making science videos. And then people just started asking me to do it for them. So now, as Joe mentioned, I make videos for a big lab out here um, called Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. They have a YouTube channel. You can check that out if you're interested. I make videos for Seeker, um, which is a YouTube channel as well. They have awesome, awesome videos about all kinds of science news on all kinds of levels. So if you're an advanced science news consumer or if you're a beginner, you can find things that you like there. And then also on my personal YouTube channel, I try to make videos about sort of the science of everyday life, like things that you might find in your fridge or in your medicine cabinet, in your bathroom. Um, what's the science behind all of that? So um, that's my goal as a scientist and a science communicator is just to help, hopefully help everybody know that if you're interested in something and you're passionate about it, then that is enough. Um, and that makes you a scientist and that there are questions all around us in the world that have such interesting answers. And you can look at everything through the lens of science um, and that science is just a, a more organized way of asking questions about the world. So that's my spiel. All right, Marin, awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. And you know, I think uh, our bacteria are getting, and viruses are getting a bad rap right now. It's not all bad. They do a lot of good things. <laughs> highlighting a few of those things so so people know a little bit more all right very cool well anybody tuning in live there's a chat sidebar on the right don't forget you can introduce yourself and send us in some questions but let's get started with a little q a action so we've got mark joining us he is tuning in from home good job mark in burbank california and yeah, he, mark yeah all right and he is wondering if you can explain a little bit about the gut flora and brain relationship is there a relationship oh. Oh, yes, Mark, thank you for asking this question. So this is a hugely burgeoning area of science that I am so interested in. A lot of scientists actually call our gut our second brain because it is becoming apparent that a lot of the microbial action in our intestines is very influential in our behavior and our psychology. And we're just really starting to uncover those interactions. Um, a book that I really recommend is called The Psychobiotic Revolution. It covers a lot of the most recent work in this area and I found it totally fascinating. But essentially just to sort of boil some of it down, a lot of the bacteria that live in our guts communicate with each other by secreting chemicals. So they're putting out all of their like oozing these chemicals to talk to each other about like how and when to grow and how much and where they're going and what they're eating. That's how they communicate with each other. And a lot of them are either identical to or very, very, very chemically analogous to neurotransmitters. So the chemicals in our brains that our neurons use to talk to each other. Um, so like dopamine, uh, catecholine, um, uh, serotonin, lots of things like that. And so scientists are starting to think that, okay, so we're having these basically neurotransmitter parties down in our tummies that has to be telling our bodies something, right? Because our bodies already respond to those elsewhere. And a lot of people think that what your microbes are talking about down here can influence how you feel and what you're thinking about up here. We're still not really quite sure how it gets from down here to up here. Um, the primary theory right now is that it may be transmitted via your vagus nerve. Your vagus nerve is like this long sort of root-like thing that Tra that travels from your brain stem all the way down to your, um, your abdomen. So we think that maybe some of those chemical signals may be traveling up the vagus nerve and into your brain. But there's some, some very, very interesting research going on right now that asks like, what are these things down here telling us um, that may influence our behavior up here? Um, there's, I, I hesitate to say like one thing definitely makes you do this because I don't think we're there yet that this research is still in its very, very early stages. But um, there is some evidence to say that like certain kinds of microbes, uh, maybe if your body is in a state of dysbiosis, so it's maybe not all of the healthiest microbes down there, um, they can be producing a stress response. Um, there may be some connection between conditions like depression and anxiety and dysbiosis in your gut flora. Um, so I highly recommend checking out that book. It's really, really interesting. All right. Very cool. And I think that leads to another point that 
uh, a career in microbiology could be a really good choice right now. Uh, lots, to yes. about, lots to discover. We're just kind of scratching the surface of these relationships and what we understand. Yep, exactly. There, it's it's a hugely, hugely, hugely burgeoning field in personalized medicine, in psychology. Um, I think in relationships between, um, you know, psychiatry and predisposition for um, mental illness or addiction. Um, it's it's huge. All right. So we've got another question here. Uh, Sarah's wondering about uh, antibiotics. Is it true that they kind of clear cut, kind of wipe out our gut bacteria when we take them? Yes. Yeah. So when you take antibiotics, um, it, especially broad spectrum antibiotics, so depending on what antibiotics you receive, um, some antibiotics are specialized to only target a certain kind of bacteria or a certain class of bacteria. So it's not that every antibiotic will wipe out all of your gut biota, right? There's uh, It depends on what antibiotic you're taking. Because um, there are two big classes of bacteria. There's gram positive and gram negative. And antibiotics are specialized to target a certain class of those and sometimes even like a particular species. So it depends. Um, but for, you know, to generalize, especially if you're taking a broad spectrum antibiotic, and that's what they're called, um, is that it targets a broad spectrum of bacteria and it will um, clear out a lot of the gut flora. I wouldn't say all, of course, like I mentioned, if you had no bacteria in your gut, you would be a very, 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 very sick person. Um, but that's often sometimes why patients can experience side effects like diarrhea or feeling nauseous when they're on antibiotics is that's because it's messing with all of your gut bacteria down here. Um, it's also why some of the uh, antibiotics um, doctors say should not be taken in conjunction with alcohol is because they um, can alter your metabolism of alcohol and alcohol can make antibiotics less effective. So um, lots of doctors say that when you're taking an antibiotic, you should also try and eat probiotic foods. So like this kimchi that I have down here, um, they make probiotic pickles or probiotic um, sauerkraut or just your good old uh, probiotic rich uh, yogurt. Um, and that that can help counteract some of the effects of the antibiotic because the antibiotic then is still targeting the bad bacteria you want to get out of the way, but uh, you're sort of repopulating your gut with those good bacteria. Kombucha is also another good one if it has probiotic live cultures in it. All right. Great question. Um, let's see. I like this one here. This next one here is where has... Uh, science communication taking you? What kind of cool places has it taken you? Oh, that is a great question. Um, well, I mean, I have to talk about Lawrence Livermore really quick, just because that is an incredible, incredible place that that my SciCon journey has taken me. Um, if you guys don't know, Lawrence Livermore National Lab is one of the Department of Energy's national labs. There are 17 national labs across the country. Um, one of them is on the ISS actually, which is really exciting. And they do science in the national interest. So things that um, affect all of our livelihoods and all of our safety and all of our health. And the lab does everything from cancer biology to nuclear physics to tons of laser stuff. And we actually have the most energetic laser in the world uh, at Lawrence Livermore. And I get to go inside of there anytime I want. And there's this whole, I mean, it's gigantic. It's the length of like five football fields. And it has this thing in the middle called the target chamber, which is where they fire 192 laser beams in at this tiny, tiny, tiny little target made of specialized materials. And I get to go in and see that and talk to the people who make the laser and who keep it running. And that one is, is pretty incredible, I must say. All right, that sounds pretty darn cool. So we've got uh, another interesting question here. This is uh, Sushin joining us in India. So they're tuning in live. Awesome. And they're curious about kind of the, the digestive enzymes or chemicals in our stomach. Why does it not overpower or subdue uh, chemicals that uh, gut flora might use to communicate? That's a great question. Um, I think most of the, the gut flora activity that we're talking about isn't actually in our stomach. It's in our large and small intestines, which are um, much less acidic environments than our stomach. Um, any flora that are living in our stomach are like highly specialized to survive in an acidic environment. They're like a very specific kind of bacteria. Um, and so what we're talking about mostly when we talk about gut flora is like lower down. So if your stomach is here, you're, hold up, <laughs> if your stomach is 
here, your intestines are lower down, they're down here um, and they're, they're not as acidic. So, um, and when we talk about like tr signals traveling from your second brain all the way up here, we're not talking about it going back up the way it came, right? So through your stomach, through your throat, through your esophagus, through your mouth, we're talking about it sort of seeping through your tissues and into your nervous system um, as opposed to going back up through your digestive system to get back to your brain. All right, so Christian here, Christian must be a student because this question here is about making the bed. So uh, he heard that it's better actually not to make your bed because Ooh. the environment is uh, less uh, maybe conducive to bacteria growth. Is that true? That's super interesting. <laughs> You know, I don't know if I know the answer to that question. I, I think um, the only thing that would really significantly alter your bed's microbiota would be washing your sheets. Um, and I recommend doing that once a week. <laughs> All right, fair I don't enough. Know if there would be like, any significant difference between an, an unmade bed and a made bed. Sounds like they're trying to get out of doing a little bit of chores around the house <laughs> with that argument. Fair enough. <laughs> All right, very cool. All right, so let's jump to another question here. We're gonna take this one. Uh, oh, I like this one. So advice for a young scientist or explorer, maybe just getting started or thinking about their future career. Awesome, oh man, great, great question. I think um, it comes back to that feeling of like, oh, I'm not good at this or this isn't for me or do I belong here? And the answer is if you care about it enough, then yes, that field needs you. Um, I get a lot of questions too from people who want to get into science communication or making videos or science writing or um, science on social media, anything like that. Um, and my advice is always just to start right? You can never learn and grow or get better at something unless you're actually doing it, right? It's that kind of old quote of, um, if you wait until you're ready to start, you will never start because you will never be ready. Um, and I, for years, you know, I started making science videos, crappy science videos in my dorm room when I was 19. And here we are eight years later, and I finally am getting to do it. You know, I've been doing it professionally for the past five or so years. And it, it had, it took many, many, many years, to be honest, of me making stuff that wasn't that great and was like well, kind of crappy for me to gain the skills and the resources and the network to be able to do it in a way that I'm proud of and do it well enough that someone will pay me to do it. And I think that's um, key for science communication, but also for science, right? There's, there's a different set of things that you would need to be able to get started. But I would say, if you wanna be a scientist, like look for any opportunity that is offered to you, um, an internship or shadowing someone or seeing what that job is like so that you can make sure that it's what you wanna devote a lot of time and energy to. And then just starting is really, really essential so that, because the sooner you get started, the sooner you can make progress. Um, and you can't make progress unless you start. So um, I would also say like, ask as many questions as possible. That sounds very generic. Eric, but I wish I had asked my professors way more questions when I was in college, not only like not about class stuff necessarily, but about their job, about their life, about more um, of the uh, less academic side of, of our relationship so that I could establish a personal relationship with them, but also so that I could really get a sense of what it was going to take to um, to be a scientist and what my options were, because it's not just a professor, it's not just academia, it's a lot of different things. All right, I think that's an excellent point. I think sometimes people are their own uh, worst enemy and talk themselves out of taking risks or chasing what they're passionate about because maybe they're not sure where to go or they think the road might be, might be tricky. So that's such great advice, just start. Do what you love, do what you're passionate about and uh, yeah, go for it, okay. Um, okay, one more question. Let's see here. So this is about, uh, you went from the lab to science communicator. Could you ever see yourself going back to the lab in the future? 
Oh, wow. This is such a great question. So um, like you said, Joe, this is a great time to be getting into microbiology. Um, and actually, before all of this started, um, almost a year ago, I was accepted into a program to go back to school um, and uh, get a master's in medical microbiology. Um, so later this year, I'm going to be going back to school and getting another degree. Um, and uh, I hope to, my hope is to build a career as both a working scientist. I'd love to to get back in the lab, do more experimentation, and hopefully publish and contribute to the field in some meaningful ways. I'm particularly interested in the gut brain axis that we've been talking about, that sort of second brain. Um, and I would also love to continue doing all of the things that I'm doing communications wise, just so that I can sort of represent both of those worlds as both a working scientist and a creative science communicator. So I'm going back to school. We're, we're going to be a uh, working microbiologist in a lab coat and some goggles. <laughs> Very cool. I know I said that would be the last question, but one more question just came oh, please. in. Yeah, yeah, I love questions. An interesting one. This is from Hip Hop Science, and he's wondering You're the best. Uh, if you've heard about this. He's wondering if you've heard um, about a company recently discovering microbes in geothermal springs in Yellowstone, mm -hmm. and, that, and your thought on microbes possibly being used as a source of alternative protein. Oh, this is fascinating. I've definitely heard of them being found in Yellowstone. They're what we call what we call extremophiles. So they're bacteria that exist in very extreme environments. So the pools in Yellowstone are super, super, super hot. They're like boiling pools of geothermal water coming out from the middle of the earth. There are these kinds of bacteria way, 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 way down on the seafloor where this is happening too. Um, and I, 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 you know, I was, I, this is something that I left off of my, my initial pitch, my initial uh, spiel, which was extremophiles like this can help us understand uh, organisms that live in very extreme environments and therefore give us this kind of model for what organisms might be living off planet, right? We, we've never found life on other planets, even microbial life, but scientists are looking at these extremophiles, these extreme microbes to see maybe this is what life on other planets might be like, which I think is really cool. So NASA is very interested in extremophiles, um, but I've never heard of them being used as an alternative source of of food. That's totally fascinating to me. I've definitely heard of microbes being used to produce all kinds of things for maybe alternative sources of energy. So producing biofuels, um, we use algae for that a lot, which is exciting. And then also something else I forgot to mention is we use all kinds of microbes in the lab as little chemical factories. So you can alter them to produce pretty much any chemical you might want. Um, like we use E. coli in the lab, which you might think of as like making you pretty sick, but there are all kinds of good E. coli. We use E. coli in the lab to produce insulin for people to use um, in diabetes treatment, which I think is really cool. But no, I'm gonna have to look into that. Thank you, Hip Hop Science. All right, well, I mean, if people aren't convinced of the importance of things like <laughs> bacteria and microbes, they better be uh, now. And I'll give a shout out to Maynard Maynard, also known as a Hip Hop MD, who will be joining us for a SciComm uh, story time on April 7th at 2 p.m. Eastern. So we look forward uh, to that event. And tomorrow, uh, our last one for the week, is with uh, Bobak Ferdowsi. So he is a NASA uh, engineer at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And we're gonna hang out with him and hear some cool stories about some of the awesome uh, space projects that he gets to work on. And then Maren, last thing for today is if people wanna follow along and uh, learn more, what sh where should they go? Absolutely, so I'm on Instagram, I'm at Marin B. that's M-A-R-E-N-B-E-A, -E Marin B. I'm Marin Hunsberger on Twitter, Marin Hunsberger on YouTube. You can catch me on Seeker's YouTube channel. You can catch me on Lawrence Livermore's YouTube channel. And also just today, um, I launched a new podcast with Seeker. It's called Surprisingly Brilliant. And me and my fellow science communicator, Greg Foote, dive into all of the weird and wacky and bizarre uh, stories that have shaped science history. So the first episode is out today. And if you're looking for something new to listen to during quarantine, that could be something fun. All right. Awesome. Well, Maren, thank you so much uh, for championing the microbes. Thank you for an awesome uh, SciComm story time. And yeah, hopefully we can connect for another event in the future. Awesome. Thanks so much, Joe. Thanks for listening, you guys. It was so nice to talk to you.